uh, young professionals meet when they um, um, when they join the industry and what are the challenges that they face. Um, let me check that uh, the audio is working well. Um, so let's start with um, what happens when um, uh, individuals join the investment industry. Um, well, over the past 100 years or so, um, there has been an evolution in terms of uh, the techniques and, and the skills that are useful uh, in order to manage investments. So think of early 20th century when investing was largely driven by speculation. Uh, there were no financial theories, there was no particular well-established way of um, understanding uh, um, flows and, and, uh, or modeling data. Essentially, most investors uh, reach investment decisions based on technical analysis. Um, now, uh, the way uh, people invested back then was uh, based on the limited amount of data and the limited amount of computational power that existed at that time, and also their limited understanding of the economy. So as a result, uh, investment uh, professionals at that time um, didn't receive a formal education. It was more like education by training. Something changed around the 1950s, and it is that academics started to pay attention uh, to how to model the economy and how to model the financial system as a whole. And that gave birth to uh, modern portfolio theory, um, capital asset price models, APT, risk factors, black shoals, market microstructure. Is an area, this moment in time when uh, analysts, uh, financial analysts appear as a profession uh, with a, a particular toolkit. This toolkit utilized uh, fundamental data and uh, econometric tools. Um, at this point, um, uh, finally, finance was beginning to be to become a discipline, and this is the moment when uh, the CFA became the gold standard of financial accreditation. Then, around the year two thousand, uh, the, there was a technological shift as a result of improvements in data storage and supercomputing and networking. So um, that's the moment when market microstructure uh, became uh, a tool um, and the, the theoretical foundation for high frequency trading. Um, and that's the moment when firms start to hire uh, individuals with a very strong uh, scientific background for research and uh, software engineering. There were, of course, scientists before in finance, but mostly they were on the Q side. They were on the sell side. So, for instance, for option pricing. This is a moment when sign, uh, scientists start to work in the investment industry on the P side, actually for developing uh, uh, investment models, large-scale investment models even. Um, and then around the year 2015, uh, there is a, another pivotal point. Uh, that's when um, alternative data um, uh, begins to proliferate, and there is a wide range of data sets. This shifts the importance from valuation, like it was in the past, like in the 1950s, towards forecasting and now casting. Uh, which is the direct estimation of various measurements. That's where we are today. We are at the point in time when uh, the arrow of progress leads towards uh, the scientific approaches to investments and automation. That's where firms get the edge. They get the edge in being better at analyzing large amounts of data, utilizing machine learning techniques to analyze that data um, and 
um, satisfying the computational requirements of machine learning methods, which means investing in automation and in high performance computing. As a consequence, scientific backgrounds are in high demand in investments. And sometimes what I um, like to present as, a, as a, a comparison in terms of the growth of uh, data in finance is the following symbol. Um, at the time when the CFA became the gold standard of investing, let's say the 1970s or, or so, um, well, that was a time when there were the moon, the moon missions and the, there was the Apollo, pro, the Apollo um, uh, uh, 11. Uh, uh, and at that time, the computational power that was in existence was very limited. So that's the moment, that's, that's the context in which uh, CFA and other um, the training programs appear. And even today, I would say many of the techniques that are taught at colleges, they appear at that time. Think of factor investing and so on. So to give you a reference of what is the historical background of the those approaches, uh, Apollo, 30, Apollo 11 uh, 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 utilized a guidance computer with a memory of only uh, 32,000 bytes. Uh, that's the equivalent to five grains of sand uh, relative to the amount of sand that exists in the world. So think about it. Five grains of sand versus the, the, the huge amount, which is... Oh, hi, Marcos. I'm just going to interrupt yes. briefly. I think your, your, your microphone just went a bit funny there. Okay. It, you just sound like you're quite far away. I don't know if you could do what you were doing before. Okay, let me check. Can you hear me better now? Um, it's still a little far, far away. Okay. How about now? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry, continue. Yeah, apologies for the problem. Um, so this is the historical context under which these uh, techniques were developed. Um, uh, today, of course, the amount of data that is available is tremendous and continues to grow. Uh, about 90% of all data recorded throughout history, going back to the Egyptians and Mesopotamia and before, 90% of all the data recorded throughout history has been collected over the past two years. And that's not going to change anytime soon. In fact, uh, uh, we will gather even more data next year. Uh, it's growing exponentially as this chart shows. Um, now, not only the amount of data keeps growing, but the complexity of the data. We're talking about 80% uh, of all data stored is unstructured. This is data that is not tabulated. It's not data that um, you can load in, let's say, Excel, or, or you can easily load in MATLAB. This is data that requires processing. It requires structuration. It requires making data science decisions about how you sample the data, how you organize it, how you link the various entities, how you uh, deal with problems in the uh, missing data or in terms of outliers and so on. As a result, finance offers today some of the most challenging problems uh, available to data scientists. So it's an exciting field to work for a data scientist. Now, let's talk about what makes finance an exceptional field, and I would even say exceptionally difficult field. Um, there are essentially five courses that every financial researcher must overcome, overcome. The first course is barriers to experimentation. And with that, what I mean is, uh, if we are developing a new drug, we can conduct randomized control experiments where we will give placebo to a number of patients, uh, and the actual 
medication to another set of uh, patients. And based on that, we can evaluate whether there is a, an actual cause effect mechanism. We can control for environmental variables. That's how natural sciences assess um, whether there is a, a, a cause effect mechanism and how the natural sciences apply the, the principle of, of falsification. The principle of falsification is essentially uh, how we determine whether a theory is acceptable or not. Um, well, we cannot do this in finance. In finance, the best that we can do is uh, Monte Carlo experiments, of, uh, but very rarely we can conduct control experiments. Perhaps in some high frequency contexts, we can uh, conduct um, control experiments, but that's more the exception than the rule. Uh, the, the second course is non-stationarity. What this means is that uh, uh, financial systems are dynamic and uh, very often um, the, the unconditional joint probability distribution changes over time. So the distribution that regulated the draws that we observe changes as time passes. That makes it extremely difficult to conduct um, um, to make any sort of inference. Uh, and in particular, we observe very often in, in finance, the structural breaks. This means that the observations are no longer coming from the process that we observed in the past. They come from a new process. And uh, we don't know when the structural break occurs. We need to design a statistical tests to derive uh, when the break occur. Also, it could be that there is no uh, sharp break. It could be that there is a drift in terms of the um, parameters that regulate the data generating process. And what I'm showing you here in this, in this uh, picture is an example of a process that is uh, producing a number of paths, and at some point in time, there is a break. Uh, well, the break in this case is relatively difficult to identify because as you can see, there are many paths in red that overlap with the paths in green. So in some cases, even though the break has a core, is very difficult to recognize. And that means to that, that, that leads to uh, suboptimal decisions. Course number three is a strict competition. And let me give you the difference between pure competition and a strict competition. So in pure competition, what it means is that uh, you have a, a situation where various players are competing for uh, an objective. And um, uh, it's not necessarily that uh, one winner takes away from the other. So for instance, we could compete for uh, someone's attention, and it means that that uh, we are trying to um, uh, get that person to buy something, for instance. And that's not necessarily a strict competition because that person may have a relatively large budget relative to uh, the price that we are charging for the product. A strict competition is different. A strict competition is a situation where um, you winning means that I lose. So it's not only that you winning means that I don't win, but there is a penalty. There is an actual cost associated with you winning. And that's essentially uh, the general case, of course, in investments. Uh, when two counterparties trade, the profit of one counterparty means a loss. Not, not only not profit to the other counterparty, but actually a loss to the other counterparty. As a result of a strict and a very intense competition in finance, there is a very low signal to noise ratio. Every time someone identifies a signal, what the monetization of the signal means that what remains is just noise. Um, it's very easy to recognize that the signal to noise ratio is very low in finance. You just need to take, for instance, a covariance matrix, let's say from Vara, and you apply a marchenko pastor decomposition, and you will see that the large majority of the eigenvalues 
fall under the Marchenko Pastor distribution, which is the distribution associated with uh, eigenvalues that come from a random matrix, not from signal, but from random uh, observations. And well, that's what you can see on this plot on the right. Now, what does this mean in terms of developing investment strategies? What it means is that it's very difficult, extremely difficult to identify a true investment strategy, a strategy that is profitable. Suppose, for instance, that the probability that some random investment strategy that we recognize is profitable is 1%. I would argue that 1% is relatively optimistic. If an investment strategy is random, the most likely scenario is that that strategy happens to be uh, false. But let's say that is 1% for the sake of the argument. Now, at the standard thresholds of 5% significance level, uh, let's say 80% uh, probability of a true positive or true positive rate, 80% uh, power, what would happen is that uh, uh, out of 1,000 trials, we would expect that about 50 are false positive and eight are true positives. That means that even though we are applying a significance level of 5%, we are expected to find 86% discoveries being false. Now think about that. It means that when uh, individuals conduct uh, inference and they write a paper, let's say about some factor, and they apply significance level of 5%, that doesn't mean that there is a 95% a probability that the strategy is true. What it means is, in fact, there is an 86% probability that the discovery is false. And that is the case even before we take into account multiple testing. This is just as a result of applying inference um, on, a, on a situation where the probability of a true discovery is is a small, which is the case in finance as a result of a strict competition. Course number four is systemic complexity. Financial systems are extremely complex and traditional statistical methods assume that uh, we uh, know what are the predictive variables involved in a process and we know the functional form, right? These are two assumptions that we make whenever we conduct, for instance, an econometric study. We believe that there is a specification, in general, a linear specification, and that these are the, all the variables that we should take into account with all the interaction effects. Now, the reality is that when the functional form is different than the one that we have assumed, uh, we will likely engage in two, um, in, in two false, in two errors, false negatives and false positives, right? Um, we will likely reject hypotheses that are true, and we may likely accept hypotheses that are false. It, it is unreasonable in finance to expect that we know for certain what is the true specification, what is the true functional form, for instance, connecting inflation with the prices of bonds or, the, or, or how inflation impacts, um, affects and so on. We just don't know these functional forms for sure, much less the interaction effects. And what I'm showing you on this plot is an example of, of a situation where the researcher knows what is a functional form, but he or she forgets one of the interaction effects. Missing one interaction effect can actually lead to um, a false negative. And uh, I cannot imagine how it would be possible for any researcher to know in advance uh, what are all the interaction effects associated with uh, most pricing equations. For instance, let's say that you are trying to build a model for real estate. What is the interaction effect between uh, the, the crime rate in, in the area and the age of the building? And what is the interaction effect between the age of the building building and pollution and so on. So there is a also course number five, which is a small samples. Uh, financial data sets um, are typically short in terms of number of time observations, but also short in terms of 
serial independence, uh, the serial, cross dependence and serial independence. So not only we have few observations, but also the observations are serially correlated and also the products themselves are highly correlated. So the, the, the system is multicollinear. So as a result, there is really very little information that we can extract from these observations. Even if the data set that says 100 years old and appears to have many different observations. In fact, the fact that all these products are highly correlated and not to mention all the issues associated with structural breaks and so on, that, that this just leads to, uh, there are, uh, we have to be extremely careful uh, about the methods that we deploy when we conduct this research. Um, very often uh, papers um, exhibit uh, models that clearly are uh, overfit in, in the train set, um, so in sample, but also they are tested overfit, which would be the, the case where someone conducts, let's say, 1,000 back tests and uh, just looks at the result of the back test, the sharp ratio, and picks the best result, and that's what gets published without taking into account all of the thousands of back tests that, that uh, are essentially hidden from the, the reader. Uh, that would be an example of test set overfeeding. So this leads again to a high proportion of false negatives and, and a high false discovery rate. So to summarize, we have these five courses, uh, financial research, uh, barriers to experimentation lead to unfalsifiable claims, right? We cannot falsify claims that are false easily. Um, Non-stationarity leads to uh, um, structural breaks that are uh, very hard to detect, uh, predictions that are unreliable. A strict competition leads to low signal to noise ratio, limited capacity, alpha decay, high probability of a false discovery. Systemic complexity um, leads to um, um, false conclusions as a result of missing uh, interaction effects, utilizing the wrong specification, and so on. And in, some, in a small sample, leads to um, inference with low power and risk of overfitting. Now, what can a researcher do given these five challenges, these five courses. The way investment firms typically organize themselves is in silos. Uh, a silo is an, organiza an organization, um, is, uh, it builds teams that operate in silos when they are asking these teams to compete with each other rather than collaborate. So suppose for instance that you're a hedge fund, you have 50 portfolio managers, and now you offer to these portfolio managers a number of services, perhaps access to data, like in data API, you offer them uh, risk management, some, you offer them some uh, trading uh, platform, but these are self-service functions. Essentially, the portfolio manager still needs to do the research, pull the data, uh, run the statistical methods, um, test themselves and uh, make a code implementation, run their own algorithms and connect the output of the algorithms to the trading platform. So it's essentially self-service um, and they are doing this all on their own. Why? Because they are giving a budget, they are giving a risk budget and allocation and they own the p &L. So they have a disincentive to collaborate the moment they collaborate, someone else will monetize from their discovery. So the, the typical structure of investment firms is uh, it disincentivizes all forms of collaboration, which of course is very damaging to the way scientists are trained and operate. This is a situation uh, where um, models have limited depth. There is so much a team can do, even, even a, a medium-sized team, let's say 10 people, there's so much they can do. Um, let's say that they are interested in uh, applying NLP to uh, trading stocks 
well, they will, even a team of 10 people will have tremendous challenges in terms of collecting the data and curating the data and developing the NLP algorithms and so on. So as a result, typically silos are populated by generalists, individuals who can do many things, but none of these things in tremendous depth. That also leads to scalability because uh, typically what happens is uh, each team runs one to a, a small number of strategies. Why? Because they need to capture the profit from that strategy. And as a result, they have to run the strategy that they develop. Uh, this leads to typically uh, uh, limited scalability. Also, the opportunities are microscopic alpha opportunities. These are opportunities that are the result of um, utilizing relatively generic data sets. The more specific the data set, the more resources it takes to uh, scrutinize and, uh, and uh, handle this data set. And as a result of the uh, silo structure, typically these silo teams will operate, they will look for macroscopic alpha as opposed to microscopic alpha. Uh, microscopic alpha being the alpha that requires a significant technological investment. Also, um, this paradigm suffers from false positives, right? Due, due to this competition, um, the hedge fund essentially is forcing researchers to uh, run a large number of uh, back tests and experiments. And, and typically what happens is that um, the, the, there is an incentive to produce false positives in order to obtain an allocation. Um, so all of these are problems associated with the silo structure and the reason why um, scientists uh, struggle uh, in investment firms. They struggle because they have been trained to operate as scientists and that means collaboration and specialization and silos uh, prevent all of that. This, this is the reason why very often 10 years down the road, you find these very promising individuals and they have not achieved their potential. They have not uh, obtained um, the success that they seem they would have obtained. Um, in, in a silo, there is no uh, peer review. There is no way to learn from mistakes. Uh, typically, what happens is a portfolio manager makes a mistake and, and loses, loses his or her job. But there is no way uh, of learning through experimentation in a safe environment. Uh, uh, silos make, of course, business sense. And you, you only have to see how many billionaires have made money by uh, running a hedge fund. But not always investors actually benefit. Um, sometimes, very often, these billionaire hedge funds actually made their money through charging uh, management fees as opposed to actually uh, de delivering uh, uh, performance to investors. In some cases, of course, there are hedge funds that are uh, very successful at, at both, but as I, I will argue in a moment, typically they have a different structure. This is a situation similar to um, the myth of Sisyphus. If you remember from Greek uh, mythology, uh, Sisyphus was uh, punished um, by the gods um, to an endless and futile task. Um, the task was to roll a boulder up the mountain. And of course, uh, in the last moment, Sisyphus always uh, fail and, and he had to repeat that job again and again and again. And a similar situation, of course, today for many quants, they are confronted with this impossible task to overcome the five courses of finance on their own, without resources, without support, without the ability to specialize. In fact, these firms are forcing them to become generalists, which makes their, the, the, the task ever more challenging. In, in the sciences uh, around the year two, 1940s, uh, there was a big shift towards big science. And I have this quote here from Nobel Prize winner, Ernest Lawrence, who makes the argument, from now on, if you want to make a discovery in science, 
you cannot do it on your own. You need to join a large team. And as you can see here in this photograph, you can see uh, Ernest Lawrence uh, seated here in the front row. And perhaps you can see this gentleman with uh, tall hair and smoking a pipe. Do you recognize him? That's Robert Oppenheimer, the, the, uh, the leader of the Manhattan Project. And uh, of course, the Manhattan Project was made possible by the big science paradigm. The big science paradigm uh, has been responsible for about 27% of all Nobel Prize uh, winners in physics. Uh, so we are talking about uh, an organization, a, a form of organizing uh, researchers that has delivered some of the most uh, astounding uh, discoveries over the past uh, few years, really, 70, 80 years. Um, now, we can apply the same assembly line approach to investments. Uh, and here I have a description of uh, what would be one possible uh, structure of an assembly line where there is a specialization for data and uh, in a specialization for a statistical analysis of uh, looking for patterns and building a theory and testing, deployment, uh, portfolio oversight, and so on. Um, if you want to learn more about these roles and how uh, these verticals are structured, I recommend you to read uh, chapter one of one of my books. You can download that chapter for free uh, in this link. I, I have put a, a copy and a link to these slides um, in the chat. You can download these, the, these uh, slides and therefore the paper and the, the chapter associated with it. Now, the alternative paradigm is to apply uh, this big science assembly line uh, approach to investments rather than the silo. Let's allow scientists to co-specialize, collaborate. Under this approach, what you're asking is a scientist to become the best that there is at something, not at everything, but at something in particular. If you find a scientist who is really good at NLP, why would you ask him to become good at execution? Why would you ask him to become good at portfolio construction? That person should become the best that there is at NLP and be part of a team that together with individuals who are experts in execution and portfolio construction, develop an investment strategy. So that's the idea behind the assembly line is to, to uh, extract the power from division of labor, uh, mastery and the ability to um, overcome together these five courses of finance. Under this uh, paradigm, you, the, the issues that we discussed earlier, like uh, issues with uh, complexity of the system and uh, difficulty in, in experimentation. All of these issues can be resolved at least to a better extent than a team of five individuals could. Um, so if you're interested in this uh, paradigm, what I will invite you is, is to, to take a look at this link and uh, um, to learn more about how uh, this paradigm is applied at, uh, at ADIA, where I work. And with that, I, I would welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Marcos, um, for your presentation. Um, and thank you, everyone, for staying tuned. I believe we have time for just a couple of questions. And um, there's a question that's come in from Carlos. Um, he says, how do you deal with a small samples curse? In particular, do you use or recommend using synthetically generated data? That's right. So there are several approaches to dealing with the small samples. Uh, the first thing that we need to understand is what a small sample uh, mean. It could be that it's a small in terms of uh, in the time domain, very few uh, observations of space in time, uh, one possibility. It would be to try and increase the sampling frequency, which is possible, for, for instance, in, when you're dealing with uh, liquid products. It could be that we expand the investment universe. And when neither of these things is possible, uh, what, what we could do is we could uh, try and expand 
the number of, um, of features associated with the phenomenon uh, to inject more information, right? The, the, in the end, the information not only comes in terms of the number of observations, but it's also in terms of the number, of the, just the amount of information that we inject into the system. Uh, um, uh, uh, for instance, suppose that we are trying to price uh, real estate. There are not many observations typically in, in a real estate data set, but we can try to gather more information about properties and in that way to try to fit a pricing equation. So that would be one possibility. When that is not possible, uh, then we would go into what Amina just mentioned, uh, where we could use, for instance, synthetic data sets. The idea of a synthetic data set is uh, we can utilize a, a, a model to, to try to uh, incorporate some of the features, not all of the features, but some of the features that are uh, embedded in the, in the data set that we have. And based on that, we can um, develop models associated with that particular price mechanism. Now, the price mechanism that we identified is probably not perfect. It's not probably uh, exactly uh, the, the one that is generating the observations, but it's better than nothing, right? And again, we are in an extremely uh, competitive environment where uh, having an edge, even if this is a small edge, can mean the difference between uh, success and failure. Okay, thanks, Marcos. I think your your microphone went a bit funny just then at the end there, but um, I'll just ask one last question. Um, with the proposal of hyper-specializing quants, don't you fear that quants lose their versatility and also that the job becomes less interesting for them? How do you see fine-tuning this to ensure quants still keep enough generalist knowledge? Well, um... The way forward is a specialization. That has been the pattern throughout the sciences. Uh, that's the that, that's what is required of a field that is increasingly complex. Um, the, the, my prediction is that the, fig, the figure of portfolio manager eventually will disappear. Uh, there won't be portfolio managers, I would say, in 20 years. Why? Because there is just no way uh, someone can capture um, uh, all of the skills associated with uh, delivering a, a, a PNL. So the, the role of portfolio manager will be split into seven, 10 different roles that need to collaborate and no particular individual has a claim over the, the profit of the strategy. So um, the, the goal, of the, 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 the sheer amount of data needed to be successful today and the, um, the knowledge associated with machine learning and, and uh, uh, modern statistical techniques and the knowledge associated with all of the computing power needed to run these models. All of this means that there, there is not a single individual who can do all of these things uh, well enough. So my prediction is that um, over the next few decades, we will see that portfolio managers just do not uh, are, are uh, they get they are in, they go into extinction essentially as a result of the Darwinian forces already present in the investment industry. That doesn't mean that the small teams cannot uh, succeed in the future. They will be able to succeed, but it will be uh, to um, for a smaller and a smaller allocations. Right, the the niche of opportunities for small teams will become a smaller and a smaller and uh, Eventually, what will happen is that um, the opportunities will not be economic anymore. Uh, so I, I would I, I would say that uh, the, the 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 best chance of a quant to succeed going forward is to join a, a research laboratory, an environment where they can work as scientists. Okay, great. Thanks, Marcos. I think. There is one more that I'll actually put to you if I could be cheeky and to ask one more. Yeah. Um, so um, considering the need for an assembly line, what's the minimum size of a quant company to be effective? I think um, this person has also mentioned about is it, is it do quant firms, the much larger ones, have a huge advantage over the smaller funds as well? Can small two to three people quant firms be successful? They can still be successful today. Uh, but again, it will be on opportunities that are vanishing. 
So eventually what will happen is that uh, in order to develop uh, a, a strategies, especially larger scale strategies, you will need a, 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 a laboratory approach with a specialization. So today still you find a small teams that are successful, but that's, go that's going to be less and less frequent. Um, so I would say that today there are still opportunities that a, a, a small team can monetize, but as, uh, as the data becomes more and more complex and the competition keeps increasing, uh, eventually the team will need to grow from three to five, five to 10. And once you are in a large number, let's say 20, 30, that's where uh, a specialization is the only way that makes sense, right? There is no point in having a, a, a team, let's say of 20 people where all of them are generalists, right? Once you are, once you reach a particular uh, critical mass, what makes sense is to look for the skills that are uh, complementary. And, uh, and that's where co-specialization brings in the economies of the scale that uh, make quant successful in the laboratory. Okay. Great, thank you so much. There's one question about that I'm actually interested in because I'd like to, um, you know, start to develop this a little bit for the event and the next one. What's your opinion on applying quant strategies in crypto markets? And um, have you have you seen much, um, you know, examples of this in your experience? Yeah, well, crypto is a very interesting space. It's a space that continues to grow. Uh, definitely, there there are many imperfections in that market is a market that is still like any new market uh, is not mature enough. And as a result, there are plenty of opportunities. On the other hand, it's not a market that has very large capacity at this time. And, and the two come together, right? The, the one, the lack of depth in the market explains the inefficiencies and the inefficiency occur because of the lack of depth. So they come together. Um, I think that um, eventually uh, crypto investments, um, whether it is in the form of uh, cryptocurrencies or uh, various um, uh, decentralized finance investments and products uh, will have a tremendous impact in our industry. And, and just like with uh, any other approach uh, to investments, the assembly line has a place to, to play, a role to play, uh, whether it is in in real estate, private investments, infrastructure, or, and yes, also crypto. Uh, once the the problem uh, becomes complex, the only way to overcome these five courses of finance is through core specialization. Interesting. Thank you so much, Marcos, um, for your presentation. Super, super interesting, and I think our most popular session today. Um, but thank you so much, um, and we'll move on to our next session. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure.